Thank you for inviting me. This is fantastic. I appreciate it. Uh, Danny and uh, NZ uh, Pug, or NZ Pug. Um, I've had a lot of fun here. We started, uh, a friend and I came here uh, about a week and a half ago. We started in um, South Island, uh, started in Christchurch, and then drove all the way down um, to uh, Milford Sound, and then flew up here just yesterday. Um, you might be able to tell that um, I wasn't really prepared for New Zealand because there's like different burns you know, on my skin, different degrees. I also have a lot of like bug bites everywhere, a little, little badge of honor. But this, uh, this, uh, this country is beautiful. I have to like make sure I come back. Um, anyways, um, so that's me, Lynn Root. You can tweet at me. Um, so as Danny said, I am a site reliability engineer at Spotify. Um, basically, I either break stuff or fix things that people break. Um, in actuality, what an SRE does at Spotify um, varies widely between different companies, but it's a combination of back-end development, uh, where my team and I run um, a few different services um, that other engineers use daily, um, as well as some like DevOps and sysadmin and all that fun stuff, but it's never a dull moment. Um, I am also um, sort of a FOSS evangelist um, at Spotify. I help a lot of teams uh, release uh, projects and tools under the Spotify namespace. So if you go on GitHub slash Spotify, um, a lot of cool stuff there. Um, and as Danny said as well, I help lead PyLadies, which is a global mentorship group for women and friends in the Python community, uh, to help increase diversity. Um, so today's talk, making sure that's all up there. Um, the first iteration of this talk was in like 2013, right when um, Edward Snowden initially ex exposed everything about um, the NSA's program, uh, programs on surveillance, um, including like XKeyscore and PRISM. And there's been a lot of uh, new things exposed since then, um, and it's been like amazing. <laughs> um, I've, uh, I've updated this talk, I've done this talk a lot in the past, but I've updated for like a lot of more historical context, um, and addition of um, how to do your own little covert like espionage spying with, uh, with Python. Um, you might be wondering uh, why I chose to speak on this topic to begin with. Um, in all honesty, I kind of wonder that myself. Uh, <laughs> This talk uh, comes with an inexplicable deep interest of mine. Um, I don't know where it comes from, but like I love espionage. Um, I read like a ton of books on like the Cold War. Um, I studied abroad in Prague. Um, one of my favorite TV shows is The Americans, which I don't know if it's over here. Um, and um, I have a few like co Cold War centric like board games. Um, I, I, I can't get enough. I know I'm weird. Um, but when I was a teenager, I read this book called Confessions of an Economic Hitman, um, and I loved it. And um, it's how, it was about how the U.S. sort of surreptitiously um, influenced other countries um, in their economic development. Uh, it actually inspired me to study economics in college, but looking back now, um, I should have known that it was the espionage and the spying um, that was of interest to me, not necessarily economics, because I definitely do, don't do anything about my degree now. <laughs> Um, but it is clear that it's not just economic development that the uh, U.S. exerts their influence upon. So when Ed Edward Snowden came out in uh, 2013, uh, it was sort of like a vacuum for everything, um, all the top secret surveillance programs that are now in the public eye. Um, and so as I, like, I read on and consumed more, uh, the more I realized that it's not hard to do this like, by myself, like with the tools that are out there freely available. And um, which is kind of scary, but of course I kind of had to do it myself. I just had to try. So the agenda uh, today, I'll first give a quick overview of like who is doing the spying. Um, then I'll give some historical context about what they've been doing um, and how we all got here to where we are today. Uh, followed by how the spying is being done and then try and convince you uh, why you should care. And I'll finish off with how this can be mimicked with a few Python tools. Um, at the end of this talk, um, I'm going to save questions for um, outside. Um, I like conversations better than just being asked questions and turning bright red. Um, so there's morning tea right after this. So um, if you want to talk, um, come find me outside. So I want to be clear what this talk is not. I'm not condoning what uh, the NSA, uh, <laughs> everything, <laughs> all the alphabet soup is doing. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to avoid being tracked or spied upon. Um, I'm not encouraging you how to spy on friends, family, or patrons of cafes with free Wi-Fi, though that's exactly what I did. 
Um, I am not affiliated with the NSA, FBI, CIA, or whatever. Um, I am not a lawyer as well, um, and I'm not a black or a white hat, just an average engineer that kind of likes to play one on stage. Um, so let's set the stage about who um, all is involved. So we have the five eyes, um, which is the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, while there are multiple agencies within each country that are involved in the data sharing, the predominant ones are the National Security Agency in the US, uh, the Government Communications Headquarters in the UK, the Australian Signals Directorate, Canada's Communications Security Establishment, and New Zealand's Security Intelligence Services, Service and um, uh, Government Communications Security Bureau, I think it is. Um, we then have uh, Nine Eyes, which includes uh, France, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Norway. Germany felt a bit excluded, so we now have the 14 eyes as well, including Germany, Belgium, uh, Italy, Spain, and Sweden. Then we have the 41 eyes, which is 14 eyes, um, plus the, those that participated in the US coalition in um, Afghanistan starting in uh, 2001. So visualizing this can um, make it seem that it's a bit difficult to maintain one's privacy. So what exactly are all these eyes doing, you might be wondering. So this is not at all an exhaustive list. Um, it's also quite heavily US focused, although there's a significant amount of international espionage and intelligence sharing uh, and cooperation. Um, so among this timeline, there are many projects or focus efforts around a particular mission. Um, and when placed into uh, political and international context, all thread together, it sort of develops a picture that is both overwhelmingly unnerving um, as well as sort of logical and predictive. So um, international espionage dates back um, further than this, um, but I chose to start here because it's uh, during post-World War II that we really start to see a heavy investment in uh, signals intelligence. So the origins of the Five Eyes group is traced back to 1941, uh, where the Allies uh, from World War II set goals for the post-war post world. Um, in 1946, a secret treaty called the UK-USA Agreement was signed, uh, essentially is the foundation of the US and the UK's cooperation on intelligence sharing. Uh, 1948, Canada joined, followed by Australia and New Zealand in uh, 1956. Uh, so the purpose of this alliance is to share signal intelligence um, among each other. Um, how they do it is each country would surveil a set of countries, uh, like for example, the US would focus on Latin America, um, New Zealand would focus on the South and East Asia, etc. Um, and so while like, the US and like, Canada would not necessarily spy on their own citizens, there's nothing stopping them from sharing what they did collect on each other. Uh, so the first project um, I'll talk about is uh, Project Shamrock. It's essentially a continuation of the US military's work from World War II. Um, it was probably the largest government interception program um, in the US during this time. Uh, Shamrock is considered an espionage exercise um, where the military was given direct access to daily copies of all uh, incoming, outgoing, and in-transit uh, telegrams uh, via the three major telegram companies. And the predecessor to this project was basically um, a lieutenant from the military asking one of the major telecom companies to, to be assigned to the company. Um, and then the, the lieutenant uh, took photographs of, of nearly everything that he could get his hands on. So about 150,000 messages um, a month were being reviewed and analyzed by the NSA, all without warrant. Um, and then they would pass that information along to other agencies like the FBI, CIA, et cetera. Um, 1947, New Zealand's first SEGINT site was built, uh, referred to as NR1. Um, this was mainly used to aid the US and UK in monitoring communications with communist and socialist organizations. Um, so all communications was collected, um, and then it was sent off uh, to other agencies like the US and the UK. Um, and uh, New Zealand didn't really produce any intelligence of its own, um, which is sort of reflective of how supportive it was of uh, American and British interests rather than um, New Zealand's own interests. Um, so then the NSA was officially established, um, but it has roots dating back to World War I. Then in 1929, the crypt, crypt, an, crypt analytic section um, of the US military was uh, shut down by the then Secretary of State, in which he said, uh, gentlemen do not read each other's mail. Uh, the first U.S. government organization to take part uh, specifically in signal intelligence was the aptly named Signal Intelligence Service within the Army in uh, 1930. 
Um, it, was then, it then went through um, a few iterations um, with a few different names and shifting directives, um, including Signal, Signal Security Agency, Army Security Agency, and Armed Forces Security Agency. Um, so the agency was a bit chaotic, um, lacked focus and direction. Um, so in 1952, um, it was redesignated as the National Security Agency uh, with a more clear outline of its purpose. And interestingly enough, since the redesignation of the NSA uh, was in a classified memo, its existence uh, was not known until, to the public until um, decades later. Um, before its exposure, the intelligence community would refer to the NSA as no such agency. Um, so this is another project from the U.S. It's a sister project to Shamrock. Um, while formerly, former, formally operating in the late 60s and uh, through the early 70s, uh, Project Minaret actually started in 1962. Um, it was first started with the NSA forming a watch list um, of Americans traveling to Cuba, and then it was expanded to narcotic uh, traffickers. In uh, 1967, names of activists um, in the anti-Vietnam War movement um, were added by President Johnson. Uh, followed by President Nixon, adding civil rights leaders, journalists, and uh, even a couple of senators. So the list included um, folks like uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, Jane Fonda, um, and funnily enough, uh, Frank, uh, Senator Frank Church, um, who will later lead the Senate uh, committee hearing that actually investigated this project. Um, project Minaret um, operated without warrant and produced uh, reports for nearly 6,000 foreigners and uh, 4,000 uh, U.S. citizens. Um, Echelon, uh, it's a surveillance program ran by the Five Eyes. Um, it was formally established in 1971, uh, but technically started in the late 60s. Um, it first started for monitoring military and diplomatic communications um, of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc during the Cold War. Uh, however, it grew to a global system for interception of private and commercial communications. Um, in the 90s, it was expected that U the U.S. was using Echelon for industrial espionage. Um, in 2001, it was recommended to the European Parliament um, to encourage uh, its citizens to encrypt communications to maintain privacy, um, as they found uh, that the NSA was passing on information to um, allow companies like Boeing to win contracts. Uh, 1972, in a U.S. versus the U.S. District Court, known as the Keith case, which is named after the presiding judge, um, the Supreme Court unanimously rules uh, that the government must comply with the Fourth Amendment uh, when surveilling an alleged uh, domestic intelligence threat. This is actually pretty interesting. The case um, was, was against a few men who were part of the, the White Panther Party, which is a radical, anti-racist, uh, white American group. Uh, who were charged with um, conspiracy to destroy uh, government property. But in a, in a pretrial motion, the defendants um, wanted disclosure of the electronic surveillance um, information that the government had on them, um, which, uh, which wasn't necessarily known. Um, so Nixon's attorney general, uh, Nixon made the attorney general say uh, that he uh, authorized the wiretapping uh, because the defendants were members of the domestic organization attempting to destroy the government. Um, so the warrants, so now warrants are now uh, required uh, for domestic surveillance after decades of intelligence uh, collection. Um, so in the mid 70s, uh, we have a lot of dirty laundry being aired from the government. Um, 1974, the Rockefeller Commission under uh, the U.S. President investigated the CIA and revealed the fact that they had been spying on dissident groups um, and opening mail, as well as uh, mind control studies like um, MKUltra. Uh, stemming from a lot of frightening press um, about the government's surveilling activities, um, the Church Committee, uh, for the Frank Church who was being spied upon, um, investigated abuses of the NSA, uh, the CIA, the FBI, and the IRS. Um, which revealed a project, uh, Shamrock and Minaret, and soon after these projects were terminated. Um, so the Government Communications Security Bureau um, for New Zealand was created in 1977 uh, for the purpose of maintaining long-standing long cooperative uh, relationship or collaborative, collaborative relationship um, with uh, New Zealand's Five Eyes partners. Um, it also fit into the larger goal of strengthen, strengthening New Zealand's um, and U.S. military relations. So very few cabinet members actually knew of the existence um, until the early 80s when it um, became its own entity separate from the Ministry of Defense. 
um, and uh, it maintains two listening stations, which um, I will introduce in a, in a couple minutes. So after all those investigations um, uh, from the uh, committee hearings, uh, the result of these investigations was the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or uh, FISA. Uh, FISA basically establishes when and how federal law and agencies can spy on people. So basically no court order is needed if one wants to surveil two foreign partners or powers, um, but one is needed if one of the parties is a, a US citizen. FISA also sets up a secret court to hear warrants um, in the same manner an ordinary court does, um, but because it's a matter of national security, um, all these requests are classified in secret. So with the FISA Act, a program called Blarney um, was started. Now this allows uh, the US to tap directly into uh, major connection points um, of communication, um, including wireless and telecommunications. Uh, it targets communications that are believed likely to contain foreign intelligence, which kind of, kind of is ambiguous. And with the timing of everything, I can't help assume that Blarney was just a reincarnation of Project Shamrock under legal pretenses. So we're collecting all this data, and now we need to store this. Um, revealed in 2008, but implemented in 1982, main core is a database containing uh, personal and financial information uh, of millions of US citizens deemed um, a threat to national security. Uh, this data comes from various agencies, including NSA, FBI, CIA, and is stored without warrant. So um, then the GS, uh, GCSB um, opened two other SIGENT stations, um, one in 1982 and one in 1989, uh, to intercept traffic around the, the Pacific Ocean, uh, the Southern Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and all the way to uh, South Africa. So to this day, to this day signal intelligence is um, gathered on places where New Zealand um, otherwise has friendly relations, um, it, but it willingly spies on um, on the request of allied nations contributing to the um, Echelon project. So I'm, I'm jumping forward a bit, um, not because there's not necessarily anything interesting going on, but um, more so because I suspect stuff has yet to be revealed um, or is otherwise difficult to, to understand when and uh, where projects started. But in 1997, uh, the FBI implemented a system called Carnivore in order to monitor electronic communications by essentially being able to customize a packet sniffer spying on all internet traffic generated by a particular person. And they were able to do this by installing um, a program directly on uh, the internet, server, internet service provider's system. And it only ended in uh, 2005 because it was replaced by like a new and improved um, commercial software, which doesn't necessarily sit right with me. Um, and so then the attacks on 9-11 uh, um, brought a significant mindset, a shift in mindset to the NSA. Um, before it was about compliance with uh, FISA. Um, afterwards, it's about how can we circumvent the law. Uh, the White House came to the NSA essentially asking what more can be done um, to fight against terrorism if the NSA had more authority. Uh, to which the NSA responds uh, with a resurfaced plan that was deemed illegal by FISA in 1999. So this plan essentially performs uh, contact chaining of metadata um, that it, hit, it had collected, where they would follow US phone numbers for any foreign connection. And so of course, President Bush um, gives the NSA the authority to begin targeting terrorist-associated phone numbers. Um, and then the president and the cabinet uh, scrambled to draft an authorization to spy on Americans, because none had yet existed. Um, president Bush then signs the order to allow the NSA's domestic spying program. Um, and the U.S. Attorney General was told to just sign it. And so with that, the spying program was now, now deemed legal, uh, triggering the NSA to feel it has the authorization to spy on U.S. calls and emails uh, without warrant. Um, and so off they go. Um, in 2002, uh, some undisclosed private sector telecoms and internet companies um, in the U.S. received letters from the NSA requesting support for the domestic spying program and to hand over data, um, including call records. Uh, then later that year, these telecoms enter into a, a formal voluntary agreement with the US to give data to the NSA, but only after um, the Washington Post exposes them in, 19, or in 2006 uh, did these companies request court orders instead of voluntarily handing over data. Um, in 2003, uh, construction of a secret room, uh, now known as Room 641A, 
um, started in AT&T's uh, San Francisco facility. It was equipped with special technology uh, that can read and analyze uh, tens of thousands of communications per second and then send those communications to a central database, which I guess is the start of like big data. Um, this program was formally started in 2003 um, with the renaming of the Terrorist uh, Information Awareness. <laughs> um, but development started in the beginning of 2000. Um, it was aimed at to gather detailed information about individuals to anticipate and prevent crimes. This was referred to as the Manhattan Project of Counterintelligence or Counterterrorism and uh, used many components of um, older programs. Congress does stop it in late 2003, um, but many parts were absorbed and adopted into um, other programs, like the next one. Uh, so Turbulence isn't one specific program or project, but it's a name for a collection of a bunch of different ones. Um, these include efforts at decrypting communications, um, injecting malware into computers, um, and a database containing metadata on particular pieces of inf information, like, uh, like email addresses. Um, in late 2005, uh, the New York Times actually exposes the NSA and their warrantless uh, spying on Americans. Uh, President Bush does confirm it, but of course not without the twist of it's for national security. Uh, the New York Times also reveals that some uh, NSA's spying is purely domestic with telecoms giving uh, backdoor access uh, to uh, communication streams. Uh, main way, um, started, um, supposedly started seven months before 9-11, um, and was revealed in uh, 2006. Uh, the NSA essentially starts storing metadata of call records that go through AT&T and Verizon. And there's essentially 1.9 trillion records in that database, with records being hold, um, held up uh, for up to five years. Uh, revealed in 2013, Dropmire is yet another surveillance program. This one uh, particularly targets foreign embassies and diplomatic staff, including a G20 summit um, for a few years. And then so after the New York Times um, articles expose the NSA's, uh, the NSA back in 2005, an unknown company uh, requests uh, the NSA to issue court orders rather than voluntarily handing over um, data. So then in 2007, a seemingly reaction to that request, the Protect America Act was passed, allowing the NSA to not need warrants to, in, in collecting these uh, communications. Starting to get more modern here. Uh, revealed in 2013, uh, Tempora started testing in 2008 and was fully operational in 2011. Um, its purpose is to basically to buffer all the internet traffic that passes through the UK's fiber connection points, um, just so that they, they can basically be searched and analyzed later on. Uh, and with this, it's supposed that the UK actually collects more metadata than the NSA. This is a bit startling to me, because um, you just have to imagine the technology required for this. Um, in a trial in 2011, the GCHQ set, um, set up probes uh, on more than uh, 200 internet links, um, with each carrying about 10 gigabytes of data a second. Um, in 2013, um, work was being done to support data flow of 100 gigabytes per second, gigabits per second, sorry, um, which is about um, a petabyte of data a day. Um, and then that data is preserved for uh, three days with metadata uh, preserved for 30 days. So the Guardian reveals another GCHQ program in 2014 called Optic Nerve. Um, and this program has been intercepting webcam images from millions of users, Yahoo users, um, who are not even suspected of any wrongdoing. They just uh, collected indiscriminately. Um, one release document mentions the use of uh, face detection for mugshots and general facial recognition. And it was also revealed that one still image um, was taken every five minutes per user. Um, but apparently, it's okay um, for the UK to do this because um, they're not required by law to minimize collection um, from its own citizens, um, unlike the NSA. Um, it, it was said that uh, Yahoo was chosen um, because it's known to be used by GCHQ targets. Um, but in my opinion, I think it was chosen because the Yahoo Messenger protocol is unencrypted. Um, because the government wants um, companies to comply, the U.S. Congress passes amendments to um, FISA that allows uh, telecoms retroactive legal um, immunity from lawsuits for those who cooperated with the NSA's wiretapping. So now customers cannot sue companies who may have violated their privacy and other rights um, because it was all in good faith. 
Um, New Zealand isn't all that innocent either, sorry. Um, in 2009, the Security Intelligence Service um, approached university lectures asking for help to stop uh, foreign, states, um, uh, foreign states gathering information on weapons of mass destruction. So a pamphlet was distributed saying, um, we are inviting uh, New Zealand exporters, manufacturers, scientists, researchers, academics to remain alert to suspicious uh, advances and seek advice on any concerns that they may have. So it's a bit like uh, the Thought Police from uh, 1984. Um, so the Hacienda Project um, is a UK's data reconnaissance tool um, where it port scans entire countries. Um, supposedly 27 countries have been scanned. Uh, they are particularly interested in, um, the, in FTP, HTTP, HTTPS, and SSH, among others, um, and looking for vulnerable services running on these ports. Uh, they collect information, or the collected information is shared and used uh, among the, the Five Eyes group. Um, to launch exploits or to otherwise steal data. Um, and scarily enough, it can infect non-governmental machines uh, to complete scans, building their own botnet, essentially, and, and enabling um, complete scans for vulnerable devices within a subnet um, within five minutes. And uh, best of all, this is, um, it only takes a simple email um, to request access to the data. Um, something good that has come out of this, actually, is um, an internet draft for a proposed modification to TCP uh, called TCP Stealth um, to hide ports of uh, TCP services. And I want to make sure um, it's known that these uh, sort of images are actual slides that um, were uh, leaked. Um, there's another thing called Stone Ghost, um, operated by the U.S. Defense, Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, it's a network for information sharing and exchange between the Five Eyes uh, countries. Um, in 2012, a Royal Canadian officer pleads guilty um, to actually having downloaded information from the Stone Ghost program and selling it to the GRU, which is Russia, Russia's successor agency to the KGB. Apparently, he just like walked into um, Russian's, emb Russian's embassy in um, Ottawa, um, offering to sell secret information. And the officer said, um, there was never really uh, Canadian stuff. There was American stuff, there was some British stuff, Australian stuff, it was everybody's stuff. So this, this is mainly just goes to show what can happen if uh, data um, gets into the wrong hands. Um, so uh, it was revealed in, from a secretary of the cabinet, Rebecca Kitteridge, um, that about 88 uh, Kiwis were illegally, illegally spied upon for nearly 10 years. Only one of the 88 was investigated by the police, uh, which is the, the uh, Kim.com. Uh, yeah. Um, and funnily enough, the uh, police chose not to uh, press charges um, against the uh, GCSB or even investigate the other 87 um, illegal attempts. Um, the GCHB said that they had an incorrect understanding of immigration laws um, since uh, uh, Kim was not born in the uh, uh, in New Zealand, um, he was granted permanent residency in 2010. Um, Speargun is um, at least um, a two-phase project ran by the GC, uh, GCSB, uh, where equipment was installed directly into the Southern Cross cable, which is trans-Pacific uh, internet cable that supports about 95% of uh, New Zealand's internet traffic. Um, in response to this exposure, the GCA, um, GCSB uh, spokesperson said, uh, we don't comment on matters that may or may not be operational. Uh, Mid-2013 uh, was when Edward Snowden came forward. Uh, many projects and programs were revealed, including, including these. We have Fairview and Stormbrew, which is upstream collection with voluntary, voluntary cooperation from uh, AT&T and Verizon. It was also revealed that under Fairview, the NSA has been tapping into the majority of uh, New Zealanders' um, internet traffic through that um, Southern Cross cable, collecting both metadata and content. Um, there's a program called Muscular, which allows warrantless data siphoning uh, from Yahoo and Google uh, without their knowledge until now. Uh, we have Bull Run, which is particularly unnerving, um, but I expect it no less. Um, it's essentially the NSA, NSA's program for crafting encryption with current methods and storing encrypted data for future breakthroughs. 
There's a Royal Concierge, which is GCHQ's tracking of, of bookings made at particular hotels. Um, and then the NSA exposes, or the uh, Washington Post exposes the NSA's programs uh, called uh, PRISM and X Keyscore. So um, PRISM stands for a Planning Tool for Resource Integration, Synchronization, and Management, a bunch of uh, buzzwords. <laughs> Um, it mines electronic data, uh, collecting intelligence that passes through U.S. servers, and it's meant to target for, uh, foreigners, but the NSA has been very elusive about the data that it might be collecting on U.S. citizens. Uh, X Keyscore is what's called, what they call a digital network intelligence exploitation system. It's basically a federated query system of completely unfiltered data. And, and it gives users the ability to query for email addresses, for um, some activity, phone numbers, HTTP traffic, extract file attachments, et cetera. Um, and it was also revealed um, by Snowden that, that New Zealand's GCSB regularly provides mass uh, surveillance data into the XQ score system. Uh, Dishfire uh, was revealed in 2014 um, and is actually a pretty scary one, not that they're not all scary. Um, every day it collects about uh, 200 million text messages from all over the world, um, including geolocation data, uh, names of, uh, from electronic uh, business cards like those V-card things, uh, border crossings, financial transactions, and even like missed called alerts. Um, so also revealed um, in 2014, but started in 2009 as a program called Mystic. And it's not yet another uh, telecom uh, surveillance program. Um, this one actually collects entire countries' phone calls, and, and not just metadata, but actual um, conversations. Um, countries that have been targeted for this program include Afghanistan, Mexico, Kenya, Bahamas, and the Philippines. Um, and the documents from 2013 sort of allude to extending the program to other countries. Um, and then Badass, uh, revealed in 2015. You have to give points for name creativity. Um, this is a joint program between the Canadian Security Establishment and the GCHQ um, exploiting privacy weaknesses um, in mobile apps and use that same technology that advertisers do, um, including uh, user location, um, their app preferences, and unique device identifiers. So you might be wondering how exactly they are doing that. Um, so basically, um, they're drinking directly from the hose. So the Tier 1 um, network, the backbone of the internet, uh, allows vast amounts of data to pass um, via the simplest path. Uh, tier 1 companies include uh, Level 3, uh, AT&T, Verizon, Deutsche Telekom, and about 15 others. And um, some even own uh, their own transatlantic and trans-Pacific cables. So major companies like Facebook, Microsoft, Google uh, tap directly into these Tier 1, uh, into Tier 1 via edges, um, or, or they too own their own, like, under-the-sea cables. And so the NSA covertly does like the same thing. They tap the edges shared with uh, tier one companies. Also probably by brute force, uh, I couldn't help but use an XKCD comic here. Um, there is that program called uh, Muscular that, that taps into um, Google and Yahoo um, uh, directly. So I think some is also done by force. And so now you might be thinking, why does this matter? And why should I care? So, uh, first off, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Um, the first one that I have is, how do, how do these companies not notice being backdoored? Um, either their security sucks, um, or they're lying um, when they're denying cooperation. Um, and then how is foreignness determined? Am I being roped in because I interact uh, daily with non-US citizens? Or maybe because I'm here in New Zealand? Um, are you now a target because um, you're one hop away from me? Um, what is done with data accidentally collected on Americans? Um, there have been articles of the NSA spying on ex-lovers um, and tracking people's porn habits. Um, and finally, how secure is this information? Um, whether I'm foreign or not, if these agencies are, um, are able to crack encryption, I'm sure that there are black hats um, able to do the same, um, or perhaps more likely, um, I don't know if their database admin has actually changed the default password. Um, so maybe you're thinking, so what? Um, I've got nothing to hide. I am not a criminal. Um, well, then I'll ask you, do you have curtains or blinds in your windows? Um, maybe uh, you'll let me see your credit card bills or, or your text messages. Uh, maybe you lead a boring life and are willing to share all of that. 
Um, but if you got nothing to hide, then that quite literally means that you're willing um, for me to photograph you in the nude. And I get all that rights of, of that, those photographs, and I can show them to your neighbors. So maybe you're thinking, um, it's not like the NSA really cares about all that. Well, um, there are some examples of metadata meta that they do pay attention to. Um, this particular slide is taken from the EFF presentation uh, from 30C3 in 2013. Um, so they know that you rang um, a phone sex service at 2.24 a.m. and spoke for 18 minutes, but they don't know what you talked about. They know that you called a suicide prevention hotline from the Golden Gate Bridge, but the topic, remains, the topic of the call remains secret. Then they know that you spoke with, uh, the, with an HIV testing service, then your doctor, uh, then your health insurance company within the same hour, but they don't know what was discussed. So it's kind of obvious what they do collect can tell a significant story. And whether or not that you're okay with allowing unknown watchers into your life is certainly your call. Um, but just because I have stuff to hide does not make me a criminal, um, nor should I be a target of surveillance. Um, there's even like 10-year-old Facebook posts that I would cringe at reading now. All right, so enough with all the seriousness. Um, let's uh, figure out how we can do this ourselves. This is a Python conference after all. All right, so the um, media tells me that I need, to, I need to look like this. All right. Does this work? Hold on, hold on. I even got little gloves, you know. I feel like Mr. Robot or something right now. All right, so I think this makes me ready to at least pretend I'm a black hat, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> I got my sunglasses somewhere, right? All right, so let's do this. I'm ready. Um, so I use a couple different uh, Python libraries here, um, the main one being called Scapy, which is just a TCP dump um, or, or Wireshark um, in Python. Um, the overall idea is um, just the wiretapping part with uh, particular filters. Um, so if you actually want to like store the data, uh, then you probably have to just collect it all that you physically could, um, connect to a data database and store it somewhere, uh, and just do queries off it. Um, so the following is just um, a proof of concept um, of how actually, uh, actually collecting particular information um, is, is quite easy. Um, so again, proof of concept and presented without warranty. Um, not condoning um, the use of um, traffic spying or sniffing, um, but if I were you, I would probably go to um, a cafe with open uh, Wi-Fi networks. Um, so a quick introduction to Scapy. Um, this makes me cringe, but this is what they suggest from <laughs> Import Star. Um, so here's, um, so I'm sniffing for uh, TCP traffic, basically HTTP traffic, and only getting um, 10 packets. Um, so if we take a look at what that is, um, you can see I have 10 TCP packets and uh, nothing else. And, and the result of that, um, I had to snip it. Um, you can see a bunch of information here. Um, if we just grab the first packet, um, we can use the show uh, method, and it gets pretty printed, essentially. We can see the Ethernet layer, the IP layer, and the TCP layer. And literally, that is all that we need to know, um, and just playing around, essentially playing around with uh, different uh, filters. So the first snippet, and because I want super slick code names too, I've called this snippet tempura, like tempura, but the food. Um, so this particular snippet is inspired by the X key score uh, program. So basically, show me everyone that has searched for a particular term. Um, so I have offline um, a PCAP file, um, and then loading it. Or if you were to do it actively, um, basically TCP and, and that host. Uh, and I've limited it to 300 packets, um, or you can save it for later. Um, so if you take a look at the packets, I do, do indeed have 300 TCP packets. If we look at the summary of them all, here's it dumped out. Um, if I just take a look at one of them, I can see that there's the raw payload there. Um, if I just get the layer, and then um, kind of, uh, you know how when you search for something, there's like a Q equals um, kind of thing, or P equals. Um, so I just parsed this out of the raw payload, and I was at the time searching for Montreal. Um, the second uh, packet, maybe about 
Um, 70 packets later, um, my second query um, was sniffed. I was looking for best chocolate in Montreal. And then the third packet, and the best coffee in Montreal. Um, you can see where my priorities lie. Um, so <laughs> I should make note that this was before Yahoo sent all of its search traffic over HTTPS. Um, uh, only switched over a few years ago. Um, so it would be definitely a lot more difficult if this was over HTTPS. Uh, so snippet two. Um, I've dubbed this omnivore, like carnivore, but omnivore. It's an X key score query, uh, maybe something like show me um, everyone from a certain country that has visited a certain extremist forum. And for this, I did not dare visit an extremist forum. I'm probably already on a list already, but I didn't want to <laughs> make it worse. Um, but this is the uh, general approach. So I have uh, this filter of like TCP and some host. Um, I have some data offline already, and I have 258 TCP packets. Um, if I take the eighth one, I guess, um, you can see I have some payload information there. And I get that um, and print it. And I was visiting PyLadies because I'm a good person. Um, and so basically, it's as simple as like if the extremist term that I'm looking for is in the, the raw payload of the data. Um, thank God it's false. Um, so then I did like a quick and dirty like traceroute function. Uh, this wraps around uh, Scabies traceroute uh, method. Um, and then let's see, I was traceroting uh, Spotify and get a bunch of um, IP addresses. I take those IP addresses and get uh, the uh, uh, coordinates for each IP. Um, so I have a few. And then I'm creating like a GeoJSON uh, file or, or blob that is essentially JSON with um, some like coordinate information on top of it. So I have this um, information and then you can actually copy and paste this into um, GitHub's gist functionality um, and they will automatically render it. So you can see um, I was actually in Canada when I was um, trace routing uh, Spotify.com, um, located in uh, Sweden. And you can see um, that the hops actually went through, uh, I think, Netherlands and uh, Colorado. Um, so even though uh, the beginning and end was two, was two non-US countries, the fact that it goes through the US is still under US jurisdic jurisdiction, which is um, a lot of, um, happens for a lot of internet traffic to, be, uh, to begin with. All right, so snippet three. Um, I named this Teflon, because that's what Echelon sounds like to me. Um, so we're trying to answer the query of give me all the emails with um, a term, a certain term in the body of the email. Um, so I'm sniffing for um, SMTP traffic. Um, I have it offline already, and I have um, a bunch of packets, as you can see. I'm taking packet, uh, the 12th packet and um, just printing the raw payload. And that kind of looks um, encoded to me. So decode it, and it's an email address. Take the following packet, do the same thing, it's some encoded string, and it's actually a password prompt. Um, the next one, I take it, and I wonder what happens when I decode it. And some password. <laughs> Um, this is just um, sample um, data. This is not actually someone's like email and login or email and password login. Um, so here, I'm, this is just a quick and dirty like a filter packet by a particular string. So I'm wanting to see if, if someone mentioned attachment in the email. So I found a query and uh, it shows me that yes, indeed, um, someone was talking about, I had to snip it unfortunately, but someone was talking about attachment. Um, in this email. All right, snippet four, I got two more. Um, I've called this cold brew, because um, since reading about storm brew, storm brew, it gave me the uh, craving for cold brew coffee. Um, and here, um, we're wanting to see chats for a given user um, during a certain time frame. Um, here I'm sniffing for um, IRC traffic, the standard port of 6667. Um, and we get like a bunch of packets, even some DNS queries are, are in there. Um, some uh, pretty printing functionality. You can see that there's some sort of chatting going on. Um, and here's the same filter packet by string uh, function that I had. Um, so now I'm searching for um, a particular user, um, Amarok. 
And you can see a bunch of like conversations from Amarok. Um, the final one, uh, I called this uh, Lucky Charms after uh, Shamrock, because that's what I craved after reading about Shamrock. And with this snippet, um, we're trying to mimic uh, the Hacienda program um, by finding all exploitable machines in a certain country. <laughs> so um, this IP address, um, it's actually um, for the host, um, for the former New York City mayor, mayor Rudy Giuliani. Um, in uh, January, the then president-elect Trump had named uh, Rudy Giuliani to be his cybersecurity advisor, um, which I found hilarious. Um, the, so the former mayor had this like infosec consultancy um, like company, um, and the site actually no longer exists. Um, but I was able to port scan um, that site before it was taken offline, and, and you'll see why I think it's hilarious in a second. So, so we scan it using MMAP, uh, Python MMAP uh, uh, library. And um, I didn't include the whole thing here, but we get um, back a list of exposed ports and services, including um, OpenSSH version released 10 years ago, um, an anonymous LDAP, um, and an exposed MySQL database. We also um, could see that, uh, there, that the site that was running was a five-year-old version of Joomla with um, unpatched uh, vulnerabilities. Um, so yeah, with this kind of information, you could easily figure out what you want to exploit. Um, it's like not like all that information is out there to begin with. So um, if we want to take a look at what this ad, uh, IP address points to, doing some, uh, getting some coordinates again and, and creating a GeoJSON, um, and putting that on GitHub, we can see that Rudy Giuliani's host was in Denver. Okay, so um, hopefully um, I've sufficiently scared you. Um, perhaps you're architecting uh, your own new bunker with um, some tinfoil hats, um, canned goods, and maybe some signal scramblers. Um, or maybe I've inspired you to um, become a script kitty yourself. Just don't blame me if you're caught. Um, the purpose of this talk um, was um, to both talk about what's going on in the world, um, as well as convey how easy it is to uh, pick up this stuff, even if you're not an aspiring black hat. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, this talk is not um, to teach you how to protect yourself, um, because in all honesty, and I hate to say this, um, there isn't a corner in which you can hide. Um, there are certainly provisions one can take, um, but as I say in the security industry, um, the def defensive side will always be on the losing end um, of this fight. Um, as there are always adversaries uh, finding um, new ways to exploit things. Um, we, very, uh, we very well might enjoy all like, what technology has brought us. Um, for instance, we're able to work from home without pants, um, or stock ex lovers with like, Facebook and Instagram and whatnot. Um, you can even hack together your own script kitty stuff like me. Um, but it's essentially up to us to keep this uh, conversation going. Um, being complacent and ignorant, um, we can't just blame technology, because um, we essentially are the ones that give technology its purpose. So, um, so again, unfortunately, I have no advice on, on how to protect yourself, just to be more vocal. And, and so with that, um, I will close this with a pretty apt quote from Martin Neymuller. Uh, first, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not uh, speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me. There was no one left to speak for me. Thank you. <laughs>